Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, that looks good, James. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so let's make a start. Okay, why is that not moving on? Data. My honours project um, when I was a student was to map seagrass beds in the UK. And uh, that involved not just mapping the beds, but also using fractal geometry to look at even the spatial patterns uh, on the actual blades of seagrass themselves. So I've always been fascinated by spatial data and mapping. And that really shouldn't surprise anybody because maps are full of really useful information. They contain uh, information on the, the identity, i.e. what are we looking at, information about the location and distribution of things, quantity and area. And then when we start to overlap this spatial data, we can look at patterns of connectivity, proximity and overlap. And they're basically the, the main concepts for things like marine spatial planning. So before I move on, I'd like to quickly introduce some terminology that I'll be using throughout this presentation. So firstly, ground truthing. What do I mean by that? Well, normally that's in situ observations of the seabed. And they're normally provided by things like cameras or grabs or human observations. And they're normally maybe point data or transects. Now, ground truthing is really important because it ultimately forms the training data that we use in models to produce habitat maps. The second important phrase that we need to, to, to understand is, is remotely sensed data. Now, for marine habitat mapping, that can come from one of two sources. It can come from optical sources like satellite imagery or planes and, and drone images or more commonly for deeper water or sort of turbid waters, we look more to use sonar and that produces our remotely sensed surface. Now, this kind of information is really important because it typically provides the predictive variables we need to incorporate into a modeling technique to produce maps. A couple of other phrases, so I might refer to bathymetry, which of course is just depth. And what we can do with depth, depth's an important predictive variable in any habitat map, but we can also use it to derive other variables that we call terrain variables. And so I'll, I'll talk more about those as we go on through the, through the presentation. Then we've got substrate, uh, perhaps more correctly, um, substratum. Um, and that's basically just the physical composition of the seabed, whether it's sand or coral um, or mud. Uh, and it's a really important basis for a lot of marine habitat mapping. And then finally, habitat. Habitat can have a bit of a, sometimes a bit of a loose terminology, but I'm going to take it to being the, the abiotic conditions that support a very characteristic, very distinct community of species. Right, so what's all the first, how hard can it be to map marine habitats when um, places like the, the moon, Mars and Venus are so well mapped. And unfortunately the, the headlines are true that um, we have better surface maps of these planets than we do of our own oceans. So areas of the moon, you know, potentially mapped to sort of a seven, a seven meter resolution. Uh, huge areas of Mars, 60% to 20%, and Venus, majority of it to 100 meters. Now, when we compare that to our oceans, we have, for full coverage, we probably have like a five kilometer resolution, which is rather disappointing, really. And that's because uh, we have a lot of this stuff on our planet, of course, lots of water, uh, which immediately limits our ability to map remotely quickly. 
And in some respects, it would be all right if our water looked like this. It may do in certain tropical places, but not around the UK. It looks more like this. Um, it's turbid. Uh, this is a secchi disc, and that's probably about half a meter down. And we're beginning to lose it already. So it's not like water's clear. It's in fact um, it's hard to penetrate, and it's often turbid. And for that reason, uh, we use a combination of optical data if you're in shallow tropical areas, or we have to use acoustics, i.e. information derived from sonars. Right, I won't spend too much time looking at this, but there's been some really important developments that have really helped advance uh, habitat mapping uh, over the, the last century. Probably the most important development was the, the development of sonar during the Second World War. And that's really greatly expanded our capability to, to map seabeds. Also, uh, during the Second World War, we collected a lot of aerial imagery, which, found, which we ultimately found to be very useful for mapping coral reefs. Uh, and that was a primary way of mapping these features until we had some of the early um, satellites in space in the 1960s. Now that's for the rope sensing, for the ground truth thing, definitely the development of cheap um, pressure resistant cameras that we can deploy onto the seabed have transformed the way we ground truth our, uh, our marine habitats. And not just the fact that we use cameras a lot on the seabed, but also the platforms that we use to uh, mount cameras onto. So now we've got access to things like ROVs and AUVs, these, under, these autonomous underwater vehicles. Now, don't be horrified. These products are becoming off the shelf uh, items now. For as little as, I say as little, but $25,000, you could potentially get a small AUV that can map um, well, temperature, salinity, and collect seabed imagery at the same time. So greatly expanding our capability to collect lots of really good tr ground truthing. Of course, in, in recent years, we have more satellites in space. They have ever better spatial resolution and an increasing number of bands that can help us discriminate marine habitats more. And thanks, um, to the European Space Agency and, and NASA and people like this, a lot of this information is free, which is quite amazing. And then of course, we've got other sort of commercial items like drones, which have also transformed the way we map coral reefs. So a little bit of the development, but let me now focus on how we, how we actually make a marine habitat map. Now, I think there are seven key steps. Step one is about understanding the purpose of a map. What do you want from your map? And, and to also, within that process, develop some sort of conceptual idea as to um, what are the important linkages that might be driving the distribution of your habitat. But um, I'll return to these and, and talk about them in more detail, but to go through them quickly, purpose. Then we want to collect some remotely sensed data. From the remotely sensed data, we might generate some derived variables, like the terrain variables I mentioned earlier. If we collect the information in the right order and we have our remotely sensed information before we do our ground truthing, then we can use that to guide how we collect ground truthing. So that's point four, optional, because sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Uh, sometimes you have a combined cruise where you might be mapping at night and ground truthing during the day, and there's not that time to update the process. Then we need to collect ground truthing. And then the next step, which is the most important as far as I'm concerned, is you have to combine the ground truthing and the remotely sensed information into one product. And that's where I'm going to be talking about sort of the geospatial modeling techniques. That will be my next talk after Tim's. So hang around for that. And then finally, we have to present a map uh, in an appropriate format uh, alongside an assessment of accuracy 
Uh, I'll come back to that as well. Marine habitat maps have a very, um, they tend to look superficially very credible, but often they are riddled with errors. And so presenting any map with an assessment of accuracy is particularly important. Right, so just in a more graphical format, let's uh, just quickly go through that process again. So this is for an, an acoustic version um, of our habitat mapping workflow. So here we've collected um, some multi-beam sonar data of the seabed. Uh, and so that's, that's our bathymetry, that's the physical shape of the seabed. Stage three is that we can get some other derived variables from the sonar data. In this case, this is uh, backscatter, which is the strength, the amount of energy that returns to the sonar. And that's really useful for telling us a bit about the properties of the sediment, i.e. how soft or how hard it is. So we, from that, we can infer whether it's a sand, whether it's a rock or mud. Then, of course, uh, the, the, the important bit of collecting some ground truthing. So here we've used uh, this drop-down camera to collect information um, from, the, from the seabed. And the final stage of puzzle together is this, this geospatial modeling technique that um, will ultimately merge it and produce our, our habitat maps. So I'm gonna go through the whole process in a little bit more detail now. Um, so you have an understanding of the, the, the whole process. So firstly, purpose. What are you trying to map? What are you trying to capture? So I think there are four thematic, this is just my opinion, I think there are four thematic um, types of map. There's geomorphology, which is basically the shape of the seabed and capturing well-known geomorphological features like seamounts, shelves, um, canyons, then you have substrate mapping. Third option I think is habitat mapping and fourth is species distribution mapping. And you can do these four types of maps, potentially I think at three, sp three spatial scales. You can do it at a landscape level. So that's a really broad scale map. So it might be say of the um, European seas or what we're trying to currently do in the Atlantic project, which is to produce a broad scale map for the entire Atlantic basin, big, big scale. Then uh, maybe inventory mapping at like a medium scale, which might be regions within national waters. And then I recognize a, a, like a site scale where you might focus on a particular area, perhaps where you're looking to develop designations, uh, trying to protect a certain feature. And the only other thing I'd highlight is mapping for monitoring, where it's, you can do it at any scale for any thematic topic, but you need higher levels of accuracy and consistency. So you need to use this kind of information to work out what kind of map you want. What do these maps actually look like? So these are some examples. This is a site scale habitat map from uh, around the UK, actually just off the coast of Northern Ireland. And this is um, where I had to map the habitat that supported certain sponge communities. So quite a focused map, quite detailed map, and focusing on habitat, i.e. the abiotic conditions that, um, that supported these sponge communities. Again, um, a site scale map here. This is for one species. This is for a particularly important bivalve species that we have in the UK that forms big reefs. And um, I did some habitat mapping, some species distribution map mapping really, to look at its current distribution, but also hindcast previous uh, distributions uh, back in the 70s and 80s to see how this important bivalve had declined over time. I uh, apologize, the image is taking, there we go. So now um, medium scale. Um, so this is for the Irish Sea, and this uh, is, it's an essential fish habitat map that uh, I generated probably about 10, 15 years ago for cod. And uh, it's, um, again, it's a species distribution model, but at a regional scale. 
And then uh, again, for, the, for this really important bivalve that we have in the UK, I've also modeled it at the distribution of the UK. So I kind of think that's the broadest scale then, that's this kind of landscape uh, kind of scale. And I think this is an important example because it shows what you can start to do with habitat maps in that um, here we have the potential habitat for uh, this bivalve. And what I've then had to do is overlap it with a lot of human pressures and human activities to understand what is potentially overlapping that habitat and causing it to decline. So there's plenty of information there on uh, the activity of uh, fishing, aquaculture, wind farms, power cables, the lot. Right, so we've talked a bit about the purpose, the thematic topics and the scale. What I think we'll talk about now is gathering remotely sensed data. Okay, and the first question is, why do we really need to do this? And the, the obvious answer is, we need data surfaces to produce habitat maps. So ground truthing, if you remember, often is point data. And we need some sort of surface where we can extrapolate that point data across a surface to produce a map. So remotely sensed data produces data surfaces, which we need for mapping. Remote sensing is also useful because of course, it produces these derived variables, which I'll talk about more in a moment. The remotely sensed uh, variables that we collect and the derived variables are they're important proxies for many biologically, uh, biologically meaningful habitat parameters. <clears throat> so for example, uh, we might collect bathymetry and from that we would extract um, aspect. Now aspect is important because it determines the amount of hydrodynamic exposure that an animal might experience at that particular location, whether it's in the sheltered side of a slope or on the exposed side. And that's also important because the amount of hydrodynamic energy you experience can cause physical damage, but it also limits the or controls the amount of food that you receive. So many of these derived variables have very important biological um, connections, and that's why we need this information. And finally, um, these remotely sensed uh, surfaces are typically the most important information we need as predictive variables in our geospatial models. So, okay, so quick recap, remote sensing comes from one of two sources. Um, if you're lucky to have shallow tropical waters, then you are, you are able to use the optical techniques for us around the UK, most of our water is too deep and too turbid. So we are limited to acoustic techniques, i.e. sonars. So I'll do a quick run through some of the methods that we use to collect acoustic information. One of the earliest techniques um, that you still find used is something called um, an acoustic ground discrimination system. And it's a single beam sonar that, as well as recording depth, also records things like the hardness of the seabed and the rugosity. It's about gaining extra information from that, that ping of sonar energy you get back at uh, your sounder. And these were very popular um, maybe about 15, 20 years ago and produced a lot of habitat maps. The other uh, acoustic technique you might hear about is side scan sonar, which produces almost sort of very beautiful photographic images of the seabed. <clears throat> As you can see, going over this wreck. Um, and yeah, very high resolution, uh, very clear images, but often they don't come uh, with depth. So you get this image. Um, but sometimes, well, typically, there's no depth information there. And because often they're towed bodies, their positional certainty is poor, unless you're using a, a beacon of sorts. Without doubt, the, the workhorse when it comes to acoustics for marine habitat mapping is multi-beam echo sounders. Uh, so this is a, an example of a bathymetric surface collected with multi-beam. It's a 
sonar that fires a, a series of beams out in a fan under the ship as it moves and it collects it at a very high frequency. So it's very easy to insonify very large areas quite quickly. As because it's of course all these things are acoustic methods, they're always in water sensors. So they're always mounted on ships, um, towed bodies, or AUVs. And what we typically get are the bathymetry. Um, if it's um, maybe a multi-beam or a single beam method, um, backscatter from multi-beam, but of course, um, that's the main product from side scan as well, but no depth. And from those, we can get derived variables as well. Okay, so um, firstly, you don't always need to collect this information yourself. Um, this is just a small list of uh, online repositories where we have existing information, uh, existing surveys. So, and you can see that many of them are for the UK, but also for the overseas territories and for, well, global coverage really. So if anybody wants this list or a copy of my presentation, send me an email and I'll send you a PowerPoint of all this information. Okay, so as I said, if you're in shallow water that's clear, then of course you've got access to the optical techniques. And they of course come from things like satellite imagery, aerial imagery, and, um, uh, and maybe yeah, from, collected from planes, but also from drones. Uh, lumped into this is LIDAR as well, which um, is a plane based method for collecting shallow bathymetry. Um, it's based on, on the, the return from two colors, two colors of laser. Uh, when you collect LIDAR, you typically also collect aerial imagery. So that's a particularly powerful method because it produces bathymetry and you get your imagery as well. So points to know about this. Well, of course, um, often it's either it's mainly limited to surface or very shallow waters. Um, but if it is shallow enough, you can definitely capture seabed features. And this little image to the, to the right here, uh, these are actually aquaculture, um, seaweed aquaculture facilities in, in Korea. Um, so beautiful image and you can see things are very clear if it's shallow and, um, and clear water. Uh, and thanks to the development of multispectral, hyperspectral sensors, we can get a lot of information from, from these sources. And one thing to, to note here actually is um, one of the recent developments, I suppose, is satellite derived bathymetry. And courtesy of Tim Labar and Stephen Carpenter, who are also at NOC, we have two excellent talks on that on Monday. So if you're interested about how to derive bathymetry from imagery, then make sure you tune into both of those talks. So what makes a good remotely sensed data set? Well, some of these are a bit obvious, but we'll go through it anyway. Clearly, the extent is sufficient to cover the area that you want to map. Secondly, is that the spatial resolution matches the the, the natural patchiness of the feature you're trying to map. This relates to something called the minimum uh, mapping unit. And it's, it's the spatial resolution where you can consistently detect the features that you, you, you need to detect. So if you know your seagrass beds are small and patchy, then you need to make sure that your spatial resolution of your remotely sensed data is sufficient to capture that. Um, Tim's definitely the expert on, on processing acoustic information, but there are plenty of processing choices you have to make whilst you're, you're dealing with the raw data. And you've got to be able to um, optimize these, but also justify them. Ideally, any remotely sensed data set would have, um, would be free from survey artifacts because one of the most frustrating things when you are trying to run a geospatial model is that they will quickly, especially if they're unsupervised, will pick up on survey artifacts. 
So ideally, you want a good quality data set. And of course, as with all your data sources, it's quite important to understand its quality. So I'd always recommend that your remotely sensed data has some sort of standalone assessment of accuracy itself. Again, um, you don't have to um, own uh, your own plane, your own satellite for this. Um, of course, things like Hyperion, um, Sentinel-2, all this information is freely available online. Uh, some of the other satellite uh, platforms uh, accessing that data is sometimes required for like a small proposal, but it's still potentially free. So again, um, if anybody wants this kind of information, send me an email and I'll make sure you get um, all these tables. Right, so stage three, we've, we've talked about the importance of remotely sensed data. We've talked about how we collect it, whether it's optical or acoustic. And now I'm gonna quickly talk about what we can gain from, you, from further processing that information. So here, this is um, the bathymetry uh, for the Irish Sea. And for the Essential Fish Habitat project I had many years ago, um, we had to try and squeeze as much information out of this as we could. So the first thing you can do is you can get things like aspect. And as I said, that is a really important link about food availability as to whether you're facing the current or if you're in a sheltered area of the current. Equally, um, you can get slope. Now, slope um, is a really useful proxy. What kind of seabed you're on? If you've got a very steep slope, it's not likely to be mud. If it's very flat, chances are it is. So again, these terrain variables that we can get from bathymetry are really important and they've got a really clear ecological link. And what's also important to note is that they are potentially independent of bathymetry. They don't often correlate. So you're, they're derived from that data, but they're totally independent. So there's no reason why you can't add them into a model along with bathymetry. You can have other derived variables. Um, so in this situation, I was modeling fish and often they aggregate around um, large rock outcrops. So all I did was a distance to surface. So it's a geographic derived variable. Um, so that's how you can turn point data sometimes into geographic surfaces. So yeah, this is the distance to these large rock outcrops, which we know are important for fish aggregations. The other thing, so this is um, a substrate map for the UK, and we can combine it with hydrodynamic models to understand potentially the amount of resuspension from the seabed. So think imaginatively, think about what's really important for the habitat you're trying to map and think about combining these things and deriving new information that might be more focused and more appropriate for what you're trying to map. Equally, you can do the same thing for remote, uh, well, for satellite uh, imagery. Um, it's not much use in the UK except for surface conditions because we have such turbid water. Um, Seki depth might be about um, two to three meters. So LIDAR may only penetrate something like um, five, maybe max five meters typically. Um, and we certainly can't directly image many things from space. Um, but so yeah, here we took sea surface temperature and chlorophyll and calculated the, the oceanographic fronts that we have in the Irish Sea. And once again, if I wanted to use that in a model, what I would do is a distance to those fronts so that I can convert line data into surfaces. And again, that's a derived variable. Now then, if, as I said, we get these things in the right order, then we have the potential to use the remotely sensed data to help us guide how we collect ground truth and data. And that really helps us because we don't want to just go out there and take random samples. We want to be a bit more focused than that. So if we've got this remotely sensed data, we can do 
typically a, a quick unsupervised classification, i.e. a clustering approach to work out what potential classes there might be within the map. And then we can use those as strata to focus our ground truthing. There's nothing wrong with random sampling, but sometimes if you have small rare habitats, you're likely to miss it. So if you have the ability to process your remotely sensed data before your ground truthing, then you'll get more focused ground truthing campaigns. Right, okay, so that's enough about remote, remotely sensed data. Uh, I'm quickly gonna talk about ground truthing. So firstly, why do we do it? Well, it is it provides the independent and unambiguous confirmation of what we're seeing in remotely sensed data. It's also really important because it helps us enrich the classifications that we produce in the end, either map classes. So from space or from acoustic sources, we might see that we were dealing with a seagrass patch. But if we ground truth it, we can start to understand things like what species is present, density, condition, uh, and other associated species with the seagrass. So ground truthing helps us also enrich the map classes that we might ultimately report. The ground truthing is also used as the, the training data for the models that we're going to look at in my second talk. Okay, so how we, the information we collect through ground truthing dictates the map classes ultimately. So it's very important that we collect ground truthing uh, for that purpose. And the final really important sort of value um, and reason to collect ground truthing is that it can be used to validate our maps. So earlier I mentioned that, of course, we really need to be able to convey to people who use our maps the actual accuracy of them. And for that, we need validation data, something independent that hasn't been used to train our models. And again, ground truthing provides that. So um, what kind of equipment do we use to ground truth? Well, um, for sediments for actually collecting samples you might use grabs or corers so this is very important for substrate mapping when we need to collect samples for particle size analysis we can potentially classify seabed composition using cameras but they're a little bit unreliable so often cameras it's very hard to distinguish fine sands muddy sands, sandy muds, muds. Very difficult. So we use grabs and corers to collect sediment and also to collect in fauna that live within the, the sediments themselves. Dredges and trawls have been the traditional way of um, uh, looking at fish and fisheries. Uh, and so I used to work in fisheries laboratory and um, we did a lot of stock assessments. And so often for things like bivalves, for fin fish, um, Plagic and demersal fish, we'd be using trawls. But of course, as I said at the beginning, things changed uh, when we developed, when we found that we could have cheap and available cameras that we could put onto the seabed. And imagery is really helpful because they're non destructive for starters. So clearly, grabs and corers are taking chunks out of the seabed. And if it's a rare, kind of important habitat. You don't want to be taking chunks out of it. You want to be able to sample it non-destructively. So imagery, video, and photographic stills are very important for that purpose. And of course, any image is full of really useful information that you can revisit for um, at different times. So you could look at the substrate. You could look at the species present. You could look at condition. You could look at body size. All that information you can extract from video or from photographic stills. And of course, we've got a variety of platforms that we can strap these cameras onto. So we have simple systems like drop-down cameras. So basically, this is a camera on a, a string, really, that you pop over the side of your boat, dangled straight down, and you're collecting important, usable ground truthing. You can also mount 
cameras on sledges that you can tow behind a boat. And they're well used in the UK for um, some of the stock assessments that we use for our um, crustacea species. You can use divers as well. Um, they can uh, collect seabed imagery, uh, particularly important for like high quality quadrat kind of work if you have a time series. And of course, I've also mentioned the use of ROVs and AUVs, which are transforming the amount of information that we can collect. Um, although, of course, they're still not that cheap. So again, um, we have uh, existing sources of information that I can recommend. There is um, a, there's a vast amount of information through uh, databases like OBIS or Pangaea. Uh, equally, uh, the Open Data UK has lots of information for the overseas territories and the CFAS uh, data are the same. So um, I often think it's, it's, it's the first thing you should do. You should visit these databases and work out what's already available. And sometimes you can augment your ground truthing strategy um, using existing information. Right. OK, so for me, ground truthing is the most important data set you will collect. Um, it's unfortunately one of the hardest to collect as well. So what kind of common issues do we see um, with ground truthing? Firstly, a lack of uh, replication. Now, as I said earlier, through acoustic and optical sources, we can um, collect huge amounts of remotely sensed data very, very quickly. But unfortunately, the rate of collection for ground truthing hasn't kept up. And if you think about the footprint of a photograph or the footprint of a grab, it's tiny. And it's very time consuming to collect this information and very time consuming to process it, especially with sediment, especially if it's complex video full of animals. So there is um, always a bit of an issue with replication. I think it's the most important factor for determining the quality of any marine habitat map. So don't skimp on it. If you think about it, um, your ground truthing, you may have to thin to remove spatial order correlation. This is something I'll come on to in the second talk. But you might have to thin it because they are too related. So straight away, you might lose some of your ground truthing points. Then you will perhaps have to balance it for different map classes. So you might have to thin out too many observations if you have um, too many in one class. Then you might have to split it again between a training and a validation data set. So again, you might lose another 30%. And then depending on mapping or uh, what modeling process you use, if it's using a bootstrapping process, which I'll just explain later, it may again withhold even more ground truth. So whatever you do, don't skimp on ground truth. Next, we have issues with poor georeferencing with ground truthing. Unless you've got access to a beacon, sometimes it can be quite poor. Um, so that's, that's quite an important issue. During the modeling process, the remote sensing typically has very high quality georeferencing and the ground truthing can be quite poor. So the modeling assumes that that, where your ground truthing point is and where your remotely sensed point is, they are exact. And then it'll build a relationship based on that exact overlap position. And if your georeferencing is quite poor for the ground truth thing, it really starts to impact on the quality and the accuracy of your models. So poor georeferencing is a, is a big issue with ground truth thing. Um, there's also issues about how we distribute our ground truth thing. Um, so, if I'm presented with a remotely sensed uh, data set, nine times out of 10, I'll admit to it. I end up doing it by eye. I think we'll have some stations here and here. It looks like we have something different here. I'll, I'll perhaps add something there. Now that sort of subjective method sometimes is quite unreliable. And it means that you can easily overlook an important habitat class, um, and then you won't model it particularly effectively. So there's lots of tools that can help you direct how you distribute your ground truthing. Um, so 
look online for those because they can be particularly helpful. Finally, I will say that sometimes it's not possible to collect ground truth in. Um, that's the situation I had with a recent survey in Belize, looking at some seagrass. So what we ended up doing was something called expert labeling. And this is acceptable when you can clearly and unambiguously see the features that you want to map on the seafloor. Sometimes it's just not that easy in that the water column makes things vague. So sometimes you don't know if you're looking at coral or coral rubble, seagrass or seaweed, sand or a fine mud. So it has its limitations, but it's very useful when you have good quality imagery in very shallow water. I think um, I will pass on that slide because I'm eating into my time a fair bit. Um, because I think we really have talked through all this. And I probably won't spend too much time on this either. It's just to, to, to come back to this point that we um, typically use expert judgment to work out where to put our ground truth in. And there's lots of different ways of doing that in a more objective and powerful way. Um, so for starters, if, if you have your remotely sensed data and you're able to stratify it before you do your ground truthing, then you can certainly stratify your sampling areas and then do either random or regular sampling within those areas. There are other more advanced statistical techniques that can do even more to help you distribute your ground truthing in all the different habitat classes you have or along the environmental variables that you have. So placing sampling along gradients, environmental gradients, maybe of depth, um, maybe of substrate type. So um, we talked about collection. I'm just going to have a couple of slides talking about important processing steps. Now, I fall into a very bad habit when I'm processing ground truthing is that I tend to look for exciting things. So sometimes when the camera hits the seabed, I'm just sort of playing it until something interesting happens, like I find a nice big coral or a clear seagrass patch. Now, I think that's bad practice. And my rule really for processing ground truthing is when the camera hits the seabed, that is my sample, regardless of whether there's a really interesting coral reef just 10 or 15 meters away. When I hit the seabed, that is my sample. That keeps things more objective and it prevents that kind of uh, temptation to look for more interesting things. And you still take notes about them, but it's best to be quite rigorous about this process. And also if, if it's a drop down system or a small ROV that you're driving down from a, from a boat or a ship, the first point of contact on the seabed is likely to have the best georeferencing as well. If you wait five minutes to travel to a, a small coral outcrop, chances are the boat has drifted or the ROV has moved. And therefore your georeferencing is gonna be poor. So my recommendation is you hit the seabed and that is your sample. Um, and also what's really helpful is as you go through your ground truthing for each station, make a note about things like visibility or camera stability, because sometimes uh, you might get to a point where your models aren't performing very well and you might want to remove poor quality ground truthing points. And if you've got data flags for that, they're easy to remove and then rerun your model. What else? I think when it comes to mapping in general, you've got to be realistic about what you can detect acoustically or optically and what you're measuring in your ground truthing. Now, I am often tempted when it comes to substrate mapping to do classes like fine sand, muddy sand, sandy mud, mud. But I know the acoustics can only really separate maybe sand and mud reliably. So just think about what kind of information you're collecting from your ground truthing. Make sure it's 
it's it's realistic to be able for a model to be able to separate those classes based on your remote sensing. Good practice was also include things like getting a, a voucher image library going as you're as you're processing your imagery. So if you find I think this is sparse seagrass, take a picture of it, a screen grab, and keep it in a library so that you can tell other people or show other people what you mean by um, good quality coral, um, small community of soft coral, something like that. Also, best practice is to get an independent check of your ground truthing processing in-house. So routinely, I will ask somebody else to repeat 10% of my work and to make sure that the consistency is there. Because of course, this is a lot of it done by eye. There's plenty of software to help you do it in a more quantitative and objective way, but even then um, there's an element of interpretation. So I can thoroughly recommend these kind of in-house QA checks. Now, the final thing I wanna talk about just is uh, habitat classification schemes. <clears throat> So when we're looking at our ground truth thing, um, we might report things like coral, seagrass, uh, bivalve bed, sponge aggregation. And what we need to be is consistent about how we label these things. And that's what habitat classification schemes provide. So they're typically a hierarchical framework where it starts at a very broad class, something like marine seabed, then it might go into sand, mud or rock. And under the mud, it might go into fine mud, mud with gravel or with a particular species. So it's hierarchical. But what they do is provide a common language uh, for each of these habitat types and typically thresholds as well. So what I call a seagrass bed will be the same thing that Tim calls a seagrass bed. And so in Europe, we use the, the UNIS classification a lot. Um, and that means that when other people are making maps, I can typically merge my map if it adjoins theirs. They typically don't merge seamlessly, typical, but because we're using the same language and the same classification, we can merge maps and we can produce bigger and bigger surfaces. Similarly, we've got classification schemes for sediments. So on the left here, we've got the, the folk classification, um, which is a classic uh, classification for sediments based on sand, mud and gravel. And in the UK, we have a modified version that has just four classes here on the right. And that's more for camera work because we really can't discriminate sediments, particularly well in cameras, they're using imagery so we have a, a modified version with just four classes. Right, almost there, we're, we're, there's a break coming. So to summarize, we, uh, for a marine habitat map, we need remotely sensed data, and that can come from optical or acoustic sources. And they're important because they provide the data surfaces, the predictive variables we need for the models that I'll talk about after Tim's presentation. Uh, we also need ground truthing and ground truthing, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that it's collected carefully and you collect as much as you can. And that is used to train the models and provides our, you know, the, the labeling for our habitat maps eventually. And the process that combines remote sensing and ground truthing together are geostatistical techniques, which I'll describe in my second talk. Last slide, um, and it's a couple of important points. First thing is habitat maps have a tendency to look very credible. I think we're hardwired as humans sometimes to believe maps, but always be um, a little bit careful when you're dealing with maps. People will take any map and they will believe it. So make sure that whenever you provide a map, you provide an assessment of accuracy as well so that they can understand what that map is fit for. Can it be used for monitoring? Can it be used for site designation? Can it be used for marine spatial planning? Um, 
For deeper water, we are typically mapping suitable habitat, not necessarily realized habitat. So what do I mean by that? The modeling will look, for, will take ground truthing points and look to find similar conditions that are associated with ground truthing points. Now, sometimes these, these are kind of like invisible combinations of parameters like slope, aspect, and depth. It's not like a big dark patch you might find on, a, on an image that would be indicative of coral or seagrass. And so what we're actually mapping is suitable habitat in some of these situations. And we're not always too sure that it's necessarily occupied by the species of interest. Quite a difficult um, concept to understand, um, but something that's, that's quite important because sometimes people go back, use your map and say, I couldn't find the coral, the deep coral reef that was on your map. And you say, well, I've mapped suitable habitat. I haven't necessarily mapped um, all the areas that are actually occupied. There's lots of good reasons why species don't necessarily colonize the entire seabed. Sometimes they can't get to it. Sometimes human pressures remove things. Sometimes they're outcompeted. Lots of reasons. And I think I am going to leave it there because I'm sure everybody's ready for a toilet break and a cup of tea. So at that point, I'll thank you for your attention. Um, I will be about, I will gladly answer questions in the chat if you have them. And at probably about um, five o'clock, I'll be back to do another presentation about geostatistical techniques. So thank you very much. So thank you, James. That's that's really good. Uh, I have got one question for you just before you, you disappear.